Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, turning out for this uh, talk 48 hours uh, before American Thanksgiving. Um, the talk is entitled Sand Table Archaeology of a Platform. Um, just a couple of um, quick words about myself. Um, so my, so I should say too, thanks to Sebastian for hosting me. I'm really happy to be presenting uh, to the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. Um, so I, um, I, I, I teach here in town in DC. I'm on the faculty at the University of Maryland. I teach in the Department of English. Um, I work in um, a field called digital studies, also sometimes known as media studies. I've published a couple of books on the history of literary computing. Um, that's the day job. I'm also a, a longtime hobby gamer. Um, and um, I, I am the, the co-editor of the Zones of Control volume. Some of you may know uh, from MIT Press. I did that a few years back with my, my co-editor, Pat Harrigan. Um, so I'm a hobby gamer, but also as an academic, um, I have a kind of um, small foothold in, um, I suppose, the professional wargaming world. I've been to the Connections Conference, so I follow that community a little bit as well. And the, the topic for tonight on sand tables is really, it's a place where these interests for me uh, really uh, intersect. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, this talk is based on an article, about a 9,000 word article that I finished over the summer. Uh, it's currently under review at a, a journal. Um, I'm not going to be reading the article. I'm not going to be reading, um, uh, at least not in its entirety. I'll be dipping in and out of it to read some individual bits and pieces accompanied by the slides. Um, one quick word on what this talk is not. Um, I, I posted a note um, to a online group um, just promoting it and got this message back. Sand tables are archaic. Uh, we've gone to insulation board sculpting, which is fine. This is not an evangelical talk. This is not a talk that's a, you know, to convince you to throw out all of your hex maps and move to uh, sand tables. Um, this is really a historical talk. It's an archival talk. Um, it's a theoretical talk in the sense that, again, um, it comes out of also some of my academic interests in media studies, the history of comparative media. Um, so with that said, um, let me offer um, this, this epigraph um, from the, the writer, Sarah Ahmed. We could describe the table. She's not speaking specifically of sand tables here, but rather tabletops in general, um, the sort of affordances of a tabletop. We could describe the table as an on device. The table provides a surface on which we place things as well as do things. And I wanted to include this at the outset because again, thinking about what a sand table really is at the most fundamental level, an elevated horizontal surface, a space for action, a space for doing things. That's really sort of the kind of philosophical um, center of the, of the talk. Um, so I use the word platform in my title, um, and that's a little bit of a, 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 a pun in the sense that a sand table is indeed a platform in the, the, the literal sense of what a platform is, but I also mean platform in the more contemporary sense whereby we, we talk about media platforms. Um, again, spaces with affordances, either digital or otherwise. Um, so. What is a sand table? If you're not familiar with the, the concept or the construct, um, in, the, in the article that I wrote, I define them as follows. A sand table is an intentional structure that is an early, indeed ancient, interactive platform for visualization and simulation. And this notion of this being an ancient, if you will, uh, certainly a very old platform for visualization and simulation, these of course are much more modern words that we associate with digital computing, um, that too is um, really sort of uh, kind of at the, the essence of what the talk is about. Um, one early 20th century source defines them more prosaic Mosaically, simply a box mounted on trestles to a convenient height or a curved table partially filled with sand. So um, sand tables indeed um, are ancient um, in the sense um, that um, 
in a certain form, they date to, to antiquity. Um, we're familiar with the, uh, with, with, with the word abacus, which comes to us um, from the, the Greek for um, abax. So the four, um, the, the four wooden tokens were threaded onto dowels as a kind of counting or calculation device. Um, we know that the Greeks and indeed probably the Egyptians used sand spread atop a kind of table-like surface or a tray-like surface as an accounting device or an accounting platform. So with their fingertips or small instruments, um, they would draw symbols, um, make marks in the sand, um, because it was a sort of removable tray, um, this could be stored for later reference. And you see the, the book on the left, this is a kind of um, children's book, if you will, from the, uh, the 1950s. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, kind of, it's a history of computing. Um, you'll see that in the subtitle of the book, the sand table in this uh, sort of ancient sense um, is, 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 is sort of branded as the, the first computer, the, the forerunner to what at the time in the 1950s were referred to as electronic brains, i.e. mainframe computers. Um, so also, and the still by way of relation to this notion of a platform, um, I want to introduce the idea of intellectual furnishings, which comes from a scholar uh, named Shannon Mattern, who again is a, a media historian. Um, and Mattern, um, in her essay on intellectual furnishings, is interested in um, things like tables, writing desks, indeed chairs, bookcases, literal furniture that is the material accompaniment to certain kinds of uh, what we might now think of as, as knowledge work. Um, so um, you can see her definition here. I recognize these furnishings as much more than utilitarian equipment. Uh, they scaffold our media technologies in particular ways and form the way human bodies relate to those media in particular ways render complex intellectual and political ideas material and empirical. And in particular, this notion of the way in which the sand table as platform regulates the um, way in which human bodies, human bodies around the table interact with its surface as a, a space, a venue for media and interactivity. Um, this too is very much part of the talk. So I would certainly include um, the sand table in Mattern's catalog of intellectual furnishings. Um, this is, um, you can see, a 1922 um, rendition for building a, a sand table. And um, incidentally, if you're wondering, the, the numerals in the lower left hand corner of some of the slides are, are references for, for myself. Um, to um, things that I want to read with you. And so let me just um, kind of give you um, this, um, this short passage. As a furnishing, an intellectual furnishing, the sand table elevates literally what may be the oldest form of inscription we have, scratching marks and shapes in the dirt with a fingertip or stick. It's seeming simplicity notwithstanding the table its base and edges, legs and trestles must be built to fairly exacting specifications in order to bear the weight of the sand. And as you see from this um, schematic here, uh, the sand table, it can be very simple, but as a furnishing, it can also become quite elaborate, built to quite exacting specifications. And there are real engineering considerations, including um, the, the, the weight of the sand. Um, sometimes the interior was lined with zinc to act as a sealant. Uh, the sand was often wetted down in practical use to aid in molding and shaping it. A wire grid would often be strung across the topmost edges of the table uh, to help translate to and from typographical maps. Um, and so, um, and again, you know, it's important to me that as a furnishing, as a table, um, 
possessed of this kind of verticality to it, the sand table is literally elevating its media platform to something like waist height, thereby bringing it into alignment with other tabletop activities, including reading and writing. Um, now, of course, um, you, we can turn to the, uh, the, the sand box as a kind of um, forerunner, if you will, to the sand table, although in fact the, the chronology is not entirely clear. Um, but this is a passage from a mid 19th century letter um, that was sent to Frederick Freibel. Uh, who was a German, um, a, a Prussian um, educational reformer. Um, this was a student of his who sent him this letter. And um, Freibel was very taken with the idea of the sand box. And um, based on his influence and recommendations in throughout the 19th century German states, um, sand gardens, sand boxes were installed in public spaces as places for children to play. And from there, the sandbox as we know it um, migrated elsewhere, including to the United States, initially in Boston, um, were probably the, the first sandboxes for play in the US. But here again in the language from von Arnswald to Freubel, it's kind of worth, I think, lingering over this very exacting sort of um, description of what the sand enables. Um, the children might play with their cubes and building blocks. I think it would give the child particular pleasure to have the forms and figures and sticks laid out in the sand before his eyes. Sand is a material adaptable for any use. A few drops of water mixed with it would enable the child to form mountains and valleys and so on. And then just back to the top, might not a plane of sand be made a useful and entertaining game? a low shallow box of wood filled with pure sand. Um, so again, this is a mid 19th century source. Um, this is um, the passage that you see here um, is from the US Army Infantry School Quarterly 1954. And this passage is describing the um, Mexican revolutionary Emilio Zapata, uh, Zapata um, using um, the most basic, the most elemental form of a sand table or sand box, literally scratching marks in the dirt. Um, Zapata glanced at the orders. After a moment of brooding silence, he picked up his machete. Using the point, he traced a large, simple figure on the earthen floor of his hut. Looks like a fan, doesn't it? The fan is all of Easton Morales to take the and so forth, a description of tactics. Um, quickly, he outlined the course of the battle, pinpointing each major campaign on the fan. With his machete, he cut in rivers, railroads, pathways. Occasionally, he bent down with a hand full of loose soil, constructed a mountain that would become an important stronghold. In a matter of minutes, Emiliano Zapata, a man who could scarcely read or write, had outlined to his lieutenants his campaigns. And again, I think you see here kind of the, the both the, the power that is and the flexibility of the sand, the earth, as a kind of inherent medium, sort of the versatility with which Zapata is able to use it um, to communicate his campaign plans, um, but then also the relationship to writing and inscription. So much is made of the fact that Zapata is largely illiterate, he cannot read or write, but of course one could just as easily argue that here he is writing, with his machete um, in, in all of the ways that mattered to the moment. Um, so another concept to bring to bear here alongside that of the platform is that of the magic circle, which I suspect has come up um, in previous meetings and discussions from the uh, Georgetown Wargaming Society. But the magic circle um, dates from a mid 20th century uh, anthropologist, Johann Husinger, um, a book called Homo Ludens, Man the Player. And it's typically 
taken as an articulation of what's special or unique about games and particular either the board or the playing field for a game. Um, what is it about that space that allows certain rules and behaviors to obtain? Um, Heisinger calls it the magic circle. All play moves and has in its being within a playground marked off beforehand, either materially or ideally, uh, just as there is no formal difference. So the arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, are all in form and function playgrounds, i.e. forbidden spots, isolated, hedged round, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are imaginary worlds within the ordinary world dedicated to the performance of an act apart. In particular, those closing phrases, the performance of an act apart. I think that's really captured in the image you see here, which has been my title graphic. Um, this was a training exercise that was conducted in the, the mid aughts in Iraq. Um, this is actually, these are actually um, mostly Iraqi personnel um, who you see here, and you clearly see it's the magic square, but it's of course the magic circle in this strikingly sort of visually um, demarcated way. Um, I particularly enjoy the fact that it is a sand table or a sand box that is um, erected within a larger climate of sand, the, the sand of the terrain, but it is um, in precisely, I would say, the way that Heisinger is describing, it is indeed a, um, a, a, space, a, a space apart. So the platform, the magic circle, um, these are key ideas for thinking uh, about what a sand table is. Um, and you see this lineage um, nowadays um, with the emergence um, over the last five to 10 years of augmented reality sandboxes. Um, if you haven't seen one of these, they're extremely, uh, they're extremely cool. They're extremely fun and impressive to play with. I'm just going to play a minute or so of this video to give you a sense. Check this out. This is an augmented reality sandbox. And this is one of the most fantastic things I've ever built for my classroom. This is sand. You can see me playing with it and it's redrawing topographic shapes as I play. This isn't magic people. This is science, but it's pretty magical. Here's what it's doing. As you change the shape of the sand, the program is redrawing new contours on top of the sand. Here's all it is. We've got a projector with an Xbox Connect looking down at the sand. This is all being run by a computer program, more information at the end. And as you move it around, the Connect sees the change in the sand and redraws new shapes. Now, specific. So, you know, I wanted to show that just to give folks a sense that this is still very much a kind of living, evolving uh, platform. And so it's fascinating to me that um, we've, we've gone back to the sand table, as it were, and are rediscovering its particular properties and affordances as the kind of haptic interface that you see here, enabled by uh, newer technologies like the, the Microsoft Connect in this instance. Um, and there are lots of uh, plans and demonstrations and tutorials online for uh, how to build a, a sand, an augmented reality sand table like this one, um, say. So I wanted to say, and this will be a, a brief portion of the talk, but I did want to kind of dwell a little bit more on this notion of um, sand as a medium. If the table is the platform in my vocabulary, uh, the sand, sand itself, I would argue, um, functions as a kind of medium. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Um, there is an entire science of sand. 
Um, and there are scientists who work with sand, the properties and behaviors of sand um, to work particular problems, whether in um, everything from theoretical physics, climate science, obviously geology, um, to, to engineering. And so um, what is sand at it in the most elemental sense? Sand is a granular material. Um, granular materials, in the understated words of one researcher, quote, behave very strangely. And a more formal definition would refer to conglomerations of not microscopic, but macroscopic particles that lower their entropy when they interact. Uh, put more plainly, granular materials, which also include coffee beans and rice, sugar and salt, lentils and seeds, and popping corn, behave as though they were somewhere between a liquid and a solid, depending on their entropic state. Um, and um, the, the precise definition of sand um, derives from these measurements on what's known as the Uden-Wentworth scale for granular media or granular materials. Um, you can see that sand from the very coarse to the very fine um, is about um, anywhere from about two millimeters to a little um, to um, 0.0625 millimeters in diameter. Um, the width of a human hair is often given as a kind of um, reference point for the diameter of a grain of sand. Um, much of this scientific work around um, the properties and behaviors of sand um, is based upon a principle known as tribology. Uh, tribology is the science of wear, friction, and lubrication, um, and it encompasses how interacting surfaces um, behave in relative motion. Practically speaking, this is all about the question of how and why a mound of sand holds its shape until of course it doesn't and it all crumbles, it, it all falls apart. Um, and so um, this is a um, kind of um, much more contemporary evocation of some of these ideas. Um, some of you may recall that sand tables make an appearance in the 2018 film Black Panther. And so I'm just gonna play a few seconds from this video, which shows uh, Black Panther, T'Challa, using a sand table on board his command aircraft here in the film. So you see, we have something very much like the augmented reality sand table, but he's also actually picking up objects from the table and manipulating them in the space above the table as well. And so he's using this display to rehearse um, a, to plan an attack on a convoy of vehicles. Now, of course, in the Marvel universe, this is not sand, this is a special material known as vibranium that has particular sort of um, superpower properties associated with it. But again, very interesting to me that the sand table is one of the technologies that the designers and the producers of the film selected in order to sort of help um, set the scene as it were and communicate something about the relationship between Wakanda and both technology and the natural resources of the, of the planet. Um, and then, um, you know, I think another way to just kind of think about sand as a medium, um, so there are, um, there, there are sand toys of various sorts um, in the sense that um, what we see here is what's called magic sand. Um, this is so-called hydrophobic sand in that it repels water. I mean, I don't think so. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see if I can get that back. You're gonna put it on them? I mean, I don't think so. 
we've got those weird structures down at the bottom. Oh my God. Oh my God. So this is my my wife and I were playing with this and it doesn't the video doesn't fully capture it but the 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 sand is my my fingertips are wet but the sand itself is dry when you pick it up so it's this very strange sensation to handle it um you have these solid structures that are underwater but then at, when you pick up the one you scoop up the sand and remove it from the water, it reverts to its particulate nature. Um, but again, it comes out dry as opposed to wet. It's, it's a very um, curious sensation. Um, and again, I just mentioned this as a way of sort of demonstrating the, the flexibility, if you will, of sand as the material basis for media, um, both liquid and solid. Um, sand is um, really, um, um, unique um, as a basis for um, making um, media. And we know this too in the way that sand is probably one of the earliest memories many of us have of playing with what we would recognize as a medium, whether it's playing in a sandbox, playing with sand castles on a beach. There's something about sand that is natural, intuitive, inviting to us. So moving on to applications um, and a little bit of history too. So it's very difficult. There's no way to, um, I don't think, pinpoint the uh, the the first sand table. I can't tell you uh, the who the individual was who built the first sand table, um, but um, we do know that the original von Reichstadt's Kriegspiel was initially played on a sand table. So you're looking here at the um, elaborate, elaborate cabinet edition that was presented to um, King Wilhelm of Prussia. Um, von Reichswitz the elder though, um, spoke about his hesitation, um, his trepidation in giving the monarch anything um, as mundane as sand. Um, and so he had this cabinet and the ceramic tiles, playing tiles that we associate with Kriegspiel. Um, he had this constructed as what he presented to Wilhelm. Um, but initially, um, von Reichswitz was playing um, atop a sand table in the earliest iterations of the Kriegspiel uh, rules, which takes us back at least to the very start of the, the 19th century. Um, I'm gonna talk for a few moments about particularly the, the Prussian military tradition here. Um, sand tables were quickly um, assimilated throughout the 19th century. You can find references and mentions of them um, by the, the general staff for the training of office, officers. Um, they were part of an officer's so-called winter work. Um, so they were of a piece with the, the map exercises, uh, the other forms of wargaming and study that would occupy the, the winter months before uh, field maneuvers resumed in the, the spring. Um, and uh, let's see, this is a very, um, this is some sort of very elaborate um, sand table um, war game um, that is um, in session. Um, I, I don't know as much as I would like to about the provenance of this image. I don't know what nationality um, is being depicted here. It may or may not be Prussian, um, but you can see nonetheless, um, you can see the, um, the screen in the middle of the table um, for um, limited intelligence. Um, you can see the clock that's being used to keep game time. You can see the smaller tables, the map tables off to either side um, that are augmenting the um, presentation on the, the sand table here. Um, they were used um, certainly throughout, again, you can find references to their use throughout the Second World War by the Wehrmacht. 
um, but not only um, on the German side. Um, so sand tables were also in wide use amongst allied planners during the Second World War. Um, this is a photograph of a sand table that was used to um, educate um, troops um, about Utah Beach. Um, and there's a scene in uh, Band of Brothers where sand tables make a brief appearance. Um, here are airborne troops looking over sand tables of their drop zones. And incidentally, you can also see the, the wireframe mesh, um, which again was meant to assist in using the table in conjunction with topographical maps. Um, then a little bit later on in this same episode of Band of Brothers, um, once the paratroopers have landed in Normandy, they're lost in the dark. One of the troopers seems to know exactly where his go he's going. His squad mate asks him how he can be so certain of the route. And the response he's given is, because I studied the sand tables. So again, very interesting to me that um, they find their way into um, a mainstream production like, like Band of Brothers as part of the historical setting. Um, a little bit more recently, this is actually, this is footage that um, was from a, um, an insurgent propaganda video um, that's dated 2012 coming out of Syria. Um, but the video, which was all about demonstrating the tactical sophistication of the um, insurgent troops, um, features a sand table prominently um, and shows how it's being used to plan an attack on a Syrian government um, military installation. Um, so certainly right up until present day, um, sand tables continue to be widely used. Um, one of the key sources for all of the archival research that I've been doing um, are these manuals that um, started to appear again in the late 19th century, um, first in Prussia um, or Germany, then in uh, Great Britain, the United States and other countries. And um, they are really uh, fascinating um, to, to look through. Um, some of them were a little bit expensive to acquire. Others um, you can find for, for pennies on the dollar through um, ABE books or Amazon or whoever your preferred vendor might be. Um, I'm just going to um, flip you through one of them. Um, this is Major um, T.W. Sloman's um, Building and Modeling Sand Tables. Um, and this dates um, from 1955. Um, and it just gives you a little bit of a sense of um, what cadets or other kinds of trainees would have been given um, by way of introducing them to the utilization of the, the sand table, um, showing section of table with trees added. Um, again, for those of us who are also hobby gamers, miniature miniatures gamers, these are endlessly fun and fascinating to look through. And this is my favorite touch. So um, colored sand was often used to dress the sand table. And here in this photograph, in this sort of flourish, if you will, um, the photograph is colorized to depict the colored sand um, going um, onto the, the tabletop. Um, again, the, 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 I mean, this, this would have um, been a little bit expensive for the, the publisher to do. And it's fascinating to me that um, it, it was done. Um, and then um, here, the, the, these kinds of kits were also commonplace. So um, everything one needed to get started with sand table modeling. Um, some other ways of thinking about sand tables. This is one of my favorite um, photographs. Um, and it sort of captures something that we see in a lot of the imagery which I've been showing, but it's particularly, I think, sort of exaggerated and pronounced here. Um, the dramatic contrast between the proportions of the figures gathered around the sand table and the 
terrain that the table is modeling. So here we see these, uh, these cadets, these trainees um, looming like giants over the, the landscape here. And the media historian in me is very interested in connecting this to the photographic tradition of aerial imagery and aerial observation, which of course itself had a uh, prominent military um, role. Um, but we also, I think, see something here of what you can almost think of as the, the uncanny nature of the sand table as a surface. Um, on the one hand, um, the, there, there's a kind of oscillation, um, if you will, between distance and proximity. So on the one hand, again, the figures, the bodies of the, um, of the men are crowded close up against the edge of the table. They're very close to it. On the other hand, there's an illusion of great distance because of the contrast in scale. And this is, I think, part of the allure, part of the sort of representational specificity from which the sand table derives its power. Um, also, of course, the, the elevated positioning, the ability to look down on the terrain, um, to move one's body, change the angle of one's head, and discover literally new ways of looking, new kinds of sight lines. Um, there's a, so in my article, I discuss, um, there's a, there was a, an interest in the early 19th century, probably the time that sand tables were institutionalized by first the Prussian and then other militaries, there was very much an interest in what was called um, cognitive touching. And basically the ability, the relationship between touch as a sense and cognition and the way in which what we might now call a kind of hands-on mode of interaction um, enabled and assisted cognition. It's very interesting that etymologically, the word touch and tactics are related to one another. Again, in an etymological sense, they derive from the same roots and they all have to do with, with touch. And so there's very much a sense, I think, in which when we think about the sand table as a media platform, it's participating in this activity of cognitive um, touch that um, dates as a kind of um, framework to the, the early 19th century. Now, we should also take care to distinguish a sand table from a diorama. And the, what I'm showing here is one of the largest dioramas ever constructed. Um, this was from, this was by the 20th century industrial designer, Norman Bel Geddes, who designed a massive um, imaginary city called Futurama for the 1938 World's Fair. Um, it's impossible to overstate the size, the scale of this thing. It incorporated a half million uh, miniature buildings, for example, thousands and thousands of miniature automobiles, some of which um, ran animat animatronically on tracks through the exhibit. And visitors um, toured Futurama by being seated in a revolving gallery, looking down and into the city. So again, the aerial perspective, but note the distance, the remove that they are from the actual surface um, of, the, of, of, of the diorama um, and the, the glass partition. They're, they're not meant to touch. Um, now, Bel Geddes, um, during the Second World War, was commissioned by Life magazine to build a set of very elaborate dioramas illustrating uh, particular battles during the war, uh, ranging from naval battles like the Coral Sea um, to massive land uh, battles like Kursk. Um, and so these dioramas that Bel Geddes built, which were exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, were photographed by Life's photographers um, to give readers of the magazine a kind of first person perspective. So what you see here, this is a kind of 
third person behind the scenes shot of one of the models being constructed, but they would have been presented to life's readership from a first person immersive perspective. Um, this is a moment, of course, without the kind of ubiquitous real time streaming media we're accustomed to nowadays. And so I'm um, lingering over Bel Geddes and his very elaborate, very impressive diorama work, whether Futurama or the war maneuver models by way of contrast to the sand table. Um, so these were not meant as interactive media, unlike the sand table. Now sand tables were sometimes photographed. Um, this is an article from the August 1896 um, issue of a, a family magazine, St. Nicholas Magazine, um, where a father and son playing with what they describe as a sand pile um, reconstructed a, a fictional um, or staged a fictional battle, which the, um, the, the adult, the father photographed um, and was very struck by the peculiar sort of properties of the photographs, noting that they could almost pass for photographs of a real battle and real terrain, um, very much in the way that Bill Geddes would do some decades later. So again, the sort of slipperiness of different modes of representation and reality that the sand table fostered. Now, again, by way of contrast, um, I would want to emphasize the interactive nature of a sand table. So, you know, these are some contemporary photographs of um, some sort of um, sand enclosure in use, but notice the way in which the personnel um, are stepping inside of the model. Um, think about the difference between that and Bel Geddes. Um, Futurama, right, and this kind of relationship to the model. Um, here, the personnel can inhabit the space of the model, they can reach into it, they can pick things up, they can touch, they can rearrange and reconfigure the terrain. And all of that seems to me to be important um, by way of articulating what is distinctive about a sand table. Um, it um, permits this kind of movement in and out of the magic circle to come back to that earlier concept. I think I'm going to, so I've, I'm about two thirds of the way through my slides. Maybe um, Sebastian, this is a good place for me to pause and just um, to see if there are any questions that have been accumulating in the chat. Yeah, Matt, so we have a few questions. The first one I have is how wildly has material like Legos been used uh, as highly available modular terrain features in modern years? Mm -hmm. um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, my, my work is on sand table, not Legos. Um, but I, you know, I think um, whether it's specifically Lego or other kinds of plastic bits, um, I do know that um, there are various sand table kits that are used in military and other instructional settings um, that have little sort of plastic bits as part of the kit um, for representing you know, structures or other elements of what the, the table is uh, depicting. Uh, and on a semi-related note, if you're interested in the use of Legos and war gaming, uh, the Army War College had a podcast about it featuring now mm. retired Colonel uh, Kenneth Gilliam on it. Um, mm. I think it was called Series Play with Legos. Uh, check it out on Google. Um, the next question is, were you able to discover what happened to the war dioramas that you referred to just a few slides ago? Hmm. I believe they're still in storage at MoMA. And I guess the next question is, are you aware of any studies that compare situational understanding imparted by physical sand tables compared to that of icon uh, icons overlaid on physical map to that of a digital display of icons on a monitor of some sort? So I guess it's a comparative study of learning and understanding yeah. across mediums. 
Yeah. Um, again, the short answer there would be no. That's not the that's that's not my primary area of emphasis. Um, those kinds of quantitative evaluations or qualitative evaluations of the the efficacy of the sand table as opposed to other forms of media. Um, I I don't know if those studies exist or not. Matt, those are all the questions I have for now. Uh, you can go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Seb, um, Sebastian. And um, I'll just say too on the, on the Lego line of questioning, I mean, of course, um, what's interesting there is that like sand, in a sense, Lego is also a kind of granular medium in the sense that it's pixelated, if you will, and it's all about composing larger assemblages out of smaller particulate constituent parts. So there is a kind of structural resemblance in that sense. Um, so I, I was going to um, sort of end with just a run through of um, other modalities um, in which we um, encounter sand tables and certainly um, hobby gaming is one of them. Um, so a number of early influencers, we might say, in the Anglo-American war game, recreational wargaming community um, owned their own sand tables. It was a, a kind of point of pride, if you will. So um, this is the illustration that accompanied, um, so Jack Scribby, who was an early um, wargaming enthusiast, um, would send people for the cost of a stamped self-addressed envelope, um, his kind of guide and introduction to the hobby. Um, it was illustrated with, uh, with this photograph of him with his sand table on the cover, um, and just an example of how sort of widely promoted um, sand tables were at a certain time um, by key hobby influencers. Um, Gary Gygax of Dungeons and Dragons fame um, also um, gamed on on his own sand table. Um, and you see him writing here um, about its specifications. Um, there's a little bit of language I want to come back to. Um, but while I look for that, let me just um, play this video footage. This was shot by some of you may know, uh, John Peterson, who writes on the history of role playing games. Um, and this is Peterson visiting the Gygax house in Lake Geneva. 72. But much of the gaming in the Gygax household actually took place in the basement. Now, there are two ways to get to the basement by this narrow, steep staircase leading down from the kitchen, which I can barely navigate with this camera. But the other way, the cool way, was to take the back entrance from outside into the basement, because then you went through this door, which even today, 40 years later, still has entrance, war games room, <laughs> written on it. Now, the basement was a gaming space because it was the location of Gygax's famous sand table. On its model terrain, he conducted miniature war games with the members of his local group, the Lake Geneva Tactical Studies Association. The sand table has been painstakingly recreated for the 40th anniversary here, and the games run here featured many people from Gary's original gaming group. All the miniature war game scenarios even, and, and the miniatures themselves, are all derived from that period 40 years ago when Dungeons and Dragons was born. And so part of what's interesting here too, if um, you know, we sort of think about the scene that's being, as it's being set and described, um, a sand table was not the kind of thing that one uh, typically uh, could have if they lived in an apartment building or a flat. Um, it required a, 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 a house. Um, a kind of you know, a, de a detached house. Um, they, they were suburban in that sense, as opposed to, to urban fixtures. Um, they were frequently um, and wisely placed in the basement of a home because of the, the weight of the sand. And um, Gygax actually makes that point emphatically. Um, he says, baby, that sand is heavy, better put it in the basement if you like. And this, to quote from another hobby source, nearly 40 cubic feet of, of wet sand weighed so much that if you built one, a sand table in the loft without strengthening the joints first, you would have found that over the next few seconds, you were fighting your battle first in the first floor bedroom, then the sitting room, and finally in the cellar, meaning that the sand table would have cra come crashing through the multiple levels of the house. But again, I, I dwell on this just because it sort of reinforces 
that there is a particular sort of demographic um, that was associated with the, the recreational uses of sand tables. Um, sand tables came with other hazards as well. There's a kind of evergreen hobby joke um, about a cat discovering the sand table and putting it to its obvious uh, use. Um, but um, the wet sand could often become smelly, uh, particularly if you were also using different kinds of dyes and color agents to um, decorate it. Um, it was obviously messy. Um, in one sort of typically sexist remark, um, one hobby publication um, mentions the importance of having a wife who is willing to, to sweep up. Um, and again, so very much the, the, the mark of a certain moment, if you will. Um, and this is a really interesting art project. Uh, it's by an installation artist named Brian Conley, who uh, wrote a piece for us in the zones of control volume. Um, but this was an installation piece he did with, um, I believe it was a gaming group based in Missouri that he entitled Miniature War in Afghanistan. Um, it's the game that you see here is being played on a sand table. Um, the US player is suspended in that harness-like rig um, to duplicate the action of a drone that's being flown overhead. So the, the US player um, gets to be a drone, but interestingly, the insurgent players are allowed to pull apart the four different sections of the table in order to um, reach into the middle of it. Um, to you know, a, a kind of reach that would otherwise be inaccessible from the edges of the table. And um, here's um, calmly just um, writing a little bit um, about the, the, the game slash art installation. Um, and I think the, uh, the key points he makes reiterates some of what I've been saying as well about the godlike hands of the players reaching in and out of the frame to gather up or knock over figures, uh, to upend vehicles and dismantling, dismantle buildings. The magic circle of absorptive involvement is made tangible, even as it is ex exaggerated to an extreme, almost caricatural level. So again, Conley is an installation artist. Uh, there are um, there's a sort of political message here about I think the the nature of modern warfare and by extension um, American involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq and the sand table is being used to kind of um, literalize and dramatize uh, the dynamics of that situation. Um, this is an early 20th century photograph from the Perkins School for the Blind from their archives. Um, these um, the Perkins is in Boston. Um, and here you see these children. Um, the, the photograph is captioned as this is this being a, ge a, a geography lesson. So the sand table is being used to teach geography to, uh, to blind children here. Um, sand tables have also, uh, in addition to military contexts, um, they are fairly widely used in training and instruction for wilderness firefighting. Um, similar kinds of scenarios are laid out on the tabletop um, as the kind of tactical problems that would be presented for a, a military audience. Um, sand tables enjoyed an early 20th century vogue um, in Sunday school instruction. Um, they were seen, um, so it's a little hard to make out in the slide and the photo, but this is a sand table display of the Garden of Eden. Um, and um, you can see the, the, the great virtue here, quote, it catches the interest of the boys, um, but um, also um, on a much more sinister um, note. Um, this is perhaps the most disturbing imagery I encountered in my research. Um, if you look closely, particularly at the, the photographs on the right hand side, um, this is from a, a wartime um, Nazi um, sand table instruction booklet. Um, and you can see the sand table is being used for this audience of children, kids, boys who are outfitted in their full Jugend regalia. Um, and again, it's, you know, I think for all of the obvious reasons, it's extremely disturbing to, to, to see, particularly sort of the contrast between the expressions on their faces. 
Um, so it does indeed, uh, for better or for worse, it indeed catches the interest of the boys. Um, Sand tables are used in trauma therapy um, as a way for trauma victims um, to recreate their experiences. Uh, the idea here is that the sand is a kind of safe space. Um, again, it's a very familiar, comfortable, inviting medium um, where childhood can serve as a touchstone. And um, as a form of storytelling, um, there are modalities in which trauma victims are encouraged to use the sand table and um, figures, accoutrements, adornments to essentially tell their story in ways that they might not otherwise have been able to tell it. And I wanted to close um, with this um, image. Um, this is perhaps one of the more famous um, photographs um, of a sand table in um, popular um, circulation. Um, and so this is, um, Lyndon Johnson and several aides um, in the White House Situation Room, 1968. They're looking at a sand table model of Khe Son in Vietnam. Um, Johnson, um, some of you may know, um, Johnson was very much obsessed with the, the action, the siege at Khe Son, um, and he, he worried that it was uh, re, that it was re, restaging um, the uh, earlier French defeat at Gien Bien Phu, which led to the France's withdrawal from Vietnam. Um, Johnson was worried that the Marine garrison there would similarly be surrounded and overwhelmed, and that this would um, have disastrous consequences for uh, the US's military presence there. So he had a sand table constructed um, and set up in the, the White House briefing room, and it would be updated daily. Um, and he and his aides, Johnson and his aides, would gather around it. Um, and you know, I think the sort of obvious, more contemporary reference here is the famous photograph of Obama and um, all of his staff and aides in the Situation Room during the Bin Laden raid. Um, of course, everyone there is looking at real-time imagery on screens. Um, there was no real-time imagery on screens in 1968, um, but instead there is the sand table. And um, you can see it here, the way that I read this image, um, the material presence of a sand table in the Situation Room in the White House, I read it as a kind of index of the extremity of Johnson's fixation, even as it captures the simultaneous power and impotence of the American position in Vietnam, this exacting reconstruction of a remote countryside erected in the halls of power, enclosed in a box, overlaying with a grid, the president and his men towering and glowering above. Note the body language, one in the group that looks like National Security Advisor Walt Rousseau, with his finger outstretched, almost but not quite to touch like a god. Another standing off to the side, arms crossed in study, and Johnson himself leaning in, hands braced, gaze almost straight down. He seems to be scrying. Surely there is an angle here a posture to be determined. And so um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, as I said, um, there's a full length um, yeah, historical, if you will, article behind this presentation um, that's currently under review at um, a journal called Gray Matter. And if or when it's published there or elsewhere, um, I will pass that on to Sebastian and um, he can, um, let you all know. But thanks so much for your attention. And I'd be super happy to take questions, um, discussion, whatever um, else would be of interest. So thank you. Hey, Matt, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. We do have some questions that I do want us to work through. Sure. Uh, first one I have uh, is, did our relationship to the space in which humans live in result in sand tables appearing? Yeah, I mean, you know, in a sense, that's 
both a philosophical and at some level, a kind of biological question. Um, I certainly can't pretend to answer it definitively, but my um, instinctive answer would be yes. Um, it's very much, I think, about the sand table is very much about our sense of um, the world being a kind of space that we inhabit, our desire to render that space, that environment uh, sort of predictable, to be able to control it, to be able to represent and model it. Um, we talk a lot about world making and world building nowadays. Um, Freibel himself, if we go back to the uh, German educational reformer in the 19th century who had sand boxes built throughout Berlin. Um, Freubel himself, again, recognized the power of that kind of world making for children. Um, and I think it's very much um, something that stays with us um, and helps to explain um, the peculiar sort of allure and fixation of, of this particular form of media. Um, it's both representational, but also um, very much something physical and hands-on. The next question asks, if dioramas like Futurama, Mussolini's uh, Plastico and, and others wear their perspectives on their sleeves, what perspectives, political, cultural, or otherwise, do you see embedded in sand tables, obscenely valued more for its flexibility than anything? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think it's hard to generalize. I think much depends on the, yeah, the, the context in which the sand table is being utilized. Um, certainly, I view the images of the, the Hitler youth children uh, very differently from uh, an image of um, a, you know, a group of firefighters training, um, you know, the training session about where to set wilderness fire breaks or the uses of um, the sand table for trauma therapy. So I think you know, much of it is contextual and situational. But again, I do think there are also some fundamentals that can help us maybe get a little bit of a handle on that question about are there particular sort of perspectives or biases that the sand table as such um, can't help but to reproduce. And I think that those commonalities um, would tend to cluster, um, first of all, again, on the relationship between the body um, and the table, um, relationships about size and proportion and scale, this notion of a kind of godlike relationship to the surface of the table um, or the tabletop world comes up again and again, um, usually as a kind of you know, virtue in the sense that um, the, the tabletop is a platform that affords um, the opportunity for the that kind of God mode experimentation, if you will, um, regarding outcomes. Um, but obviously, I think there's a lot that one can sort of read into the the posture and the relationship of bodies as they surround the table. Um, I think too, it's always interesting to think about. It's, it's very interesting to think about miniaturization. It's interesting to think about the different kinds of modeling that the tabletop affords. So what you see here is relatively sort of crude and abstract, if you will, um, but other sand tables are addressed much more expressively, much more capaciously in terms of the terrain, structures, other forms of material adornment. So all of that, I think all of those different dynamics are part of what would sort of inform um, our thinking about our underlying sort of relationship or attitude towards the sand table as a, we, we know that technologies are also always political, um, media and technologies are always inherently political, um, and certainly the sand table is no exception. Um, so it's, it's clearly, I think, a technology or a medium that's about certain forms of mastery, I think is what I would say. Mastery, but also experimentation. Yeah, that's great, Matt. Uh, this next question is a bit of a comment wrapped 
uh, a question wrapped in a comment. So bear with me. It seems to me that the principal value of a sand table is, a, uh, is to allow a top-down visceral superior uh, understanding of terrain. As you know, GHQ and other companies have long uh, offered styrofoam and other rubber and wood hexagon pieces that allow one to obtain similar results to a sand table without actually requiring sand. Mm. I would consider these 3D represent uh, representations to be uh, effectively just as valuable as sand tables. Uh, do you agree? I think so. Um, and I think the great virtue of the sand table historically, so again, if we think about whether one sees its origins indeed in antiquity or else in certainly by the 18th and 19th century, um, still there, there was no GHQ right in 19th century Prussia, um, but the idea of the sand table um, was seen as something that was um, universally implementable. In other words, anyone could build the sand table. This is one of the sort of interesting contradictions, I think, that emerges through the writing around them. On the one hand, they're presented as very simple sorts of intellectual furnishings, to go back to that earliest framework I put them in, um, a table, a kind of raised platform filled with sand, um, anyone with a little bit of wood and some sand could build their own. On the other hand, um, as we also see, um, they require a lot of upkeep. Um, they require dedicated space in a home or in a building. Um, they're messy, and so they're not as simple as it might first appear. Um, not surprising, particularly in hobby contexts, then, that um, other forms of terrain, if you will, um, have become much more commonplace. I mean, one still sees sand tables very occasionally at a convention as a kind of showpiece or curiosity, but they're not widely used. They're not popular nowadays um, as gaming surfaces. Um, I think because there are more convenient alternatives at hand. Um, I do think, though, that ultimately there is something very distinctive about sand as a medium and the allure of being able to kind of sculpt it and play with it in some of the ways we've been talking about that is different from those kinds of prefabricated technology, those prefabricated sort of hobby um, products. And um, that, I think, remains distinctive. So on that note, one of the things I want to ask you to elaborate on is what, how do sand tables with physical sand interact with things that are more miniature based, like you know, that is uh, pretty popular in historical uh, gaming circles? And, and where do you draw the line between dioramas, miniatures, and sand tables? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, the line is always going to be fuzzy and subjective, and um, certainly I think one can quote unquote interact with the diorama. Um, there are ways in which one sees sand tables. I think the, the Brian Conley one here actually, I mean, it's not clear in his own accounts of the um, project, whether it was more of an installation or more of a dynamic game, how much of a game was actually played. So, you know, these are not hard and fast distinctions by, by any means. Um, and what was the first part of your question, Sebastian? So, you know, I mean, where do, you know, I mean, how do they relate to each other in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, I mean, are there a family of you know, uh, mediums and from your perspective? I think so. I think there's there's clearly a kind of, as you say, a kind of family linkage, a family association between the diorama, between tabletop recreational miniatures games or board games for that matter, and sand tables that are meant for instructional use. Um, and again, there are sort of common postures and affordances. Um, I think there's a sense in which we tend to think about media, um, certainly interactive media in sort of the vertical plane, if you will. In other words, screens, which we tend to um, relate to on the vertical plane. Um, 
sand tables, dioramas, uh, tabletop board games. These are all forms of representation, forms of media that occupy a horizontal plane. I think that does change our mode of interaction and engagement. Um, I think the augmented reality sand tables that we looked at early on are sort of um, yeah, building on that. In other words, there's there there is a particular um, there. I think there 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 is something different and distinctive about um, this kind of relationship to a media surface um, as opposed to an individual um, looking at their yeah you know, either looking at their phone or looking at their laptop screen. So one of the questions I want to ask um, is, what do you see as a future of sand tables and terrain models in both hobby wargaming and professional military usage? Mm -hmm. It's hard. I mean, I don't have that particular crystal ball at my disposal. I think they will probably um, remain curiosities. I certainly don't foresee a kind of hobby resurgence of interest in the sand table anytime soon. Um, I know that a number of a number of companies have tried to market the augmented reality sand table um, to sort to to various um, defense clients um, as the as the next big thing. Um, there are some real virtues. I mean, you can do some really interesting things. You can obviously draw from sort of real time GIS imagery and use that. Um, to create the the surface of the table, um, you can um, you, you 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 can store and save sessions. So there are lots of I think really interesting things that one can do with something like the Aries platform. But you know I think ultimately there's a sense in which. Um, they they are always going to require a particular investment in resources and space um, and in training to use effectively. And I'm not sure how widespread that's going to become. Now, if we're talking again at the most elemental level, um, more the sort of thing that we saw in the footage from the um, Syrian um, propaganda video, um, if I can go all the way back and find that, um, you know, certainly where, or if you think about the um, Emiliano Zapata anecdote that I related, right, if we're literally talking about the earth, the ground as platform, and you know, using simple basic materials, at canned materials, um, to turn that patch of earth into a kind of magic circle that has that representational capacity, you know, I think that's going to be with us always. Um, so I think ultimately, you know, the extent to which one can predict the future of the sand table, it's about what part of that spectrum from something like the Aries display on the one end of the spectrum to something very basic like what you see here, what, what end of the spectrum are we interested in trying to predict? Um, it's hard to see this kind of activity as not remaining nearly universal in human experience. Having built many of these sand tables myself back in my enlisted days, I don't think they will ever go away. Mm -hmm. um, but I will ask you a question is, uh, why do you think you know, I mean, systems that you know, I mean, try to bring the sand table to, I guess, the next technological step, like with Aries, right? I think that was back in, what, 2014 or 15, yeah. if I remember yeah. correctly? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember ever seeing them out in, uh, in, the, you know, out in the military beyond yeah. those demos. Uh, yeah. Why do you think that is the case? And why do you think, or do you think it is sort of a, uh, it's easier just to do aug uh, like you know, augmented reality, virtual reality now, versus sort of um, sand tables with you know, yeah. VR baked into it. Yeah, I think like like a lot of sort of you know, high tech demos where you've got sort of new technology, um, it's it's always tempting to sort of experiment whether there's actual utility behind it. Um, always remains to be seen. Um, it's not obvious to me that there was ever a kind of killer app, if you will, for the augmented reality sand table. In other words, something it did so well, so irreplaceably that no other modality could possibly compete with it. Um, and, you know, but they have found um, they are 
why they, 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 they have become, I think, somewhat popular in other settings. So the, the clip that I showed um, was actually from a, a high school science teacher's YouTube channel. Um, and he, you know, he built his own version of the Aries using the, um, the Microsoft Connect. And um, you know, by his account, his students love it and it's their favorite thing. Um, and we have one on campus here at the University of Maryland in one of our maker spaces. So I do think you know, they, they pop up in different contexts and settings. Um, it's not clear to me, as I say, that they've, that, you know, we've ever seen that, that they've ever progressed beyond a kind of experimental or novelty as our sort of relationship to them, which doesn't make them any less interesting, but helps explain maybe why they haven't become ubiquitous as the next big thing. So as I wait for some last minute questions to go into it, um, how do you see your study, for example, the study of you know, sand tables as a medium um, over history sort of evolving for yourself as a scholar or as a gamer? Um, and I'll have follow up with the last uh, one of my favorite questions is what do you have working on next? You know, what is your next project, your next paper, the uh -huh. next game you want to play? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll take the the first part of that, I guess, first, which is that, um, again, for me, um, my primary sort of um, objective here, if you will, is to uh, reintroduce the sand table as a particular sort of fixture or element in media history. Um, there's a sense in which I think um, they were once part of such histories. Um, as we see from this, for example, this 1950s era book, um, they sort of dropped out of the narrative, the stories that we tell about the history of computers and interactive devices and other kinds of media surfaces. So part of this is a kind of historical recovery project in which as a scholar interested in such things, I'm interested in thinking about what changes when we reintroduce the sand table as this kind of you know peculiar piece of intellectual furniture that appears and reappears in lots of different historical contexts and settings what happens when we reintroduce it into media history so that's the sort of academic objective behind the um the the paper or the article that i wrote um I don't know that it's going to be part of a larger project. Um, I, I'm not planning to write now a book about sand tables. I think I was able to get you know, what I wanted to say said in the article. Um, in terms of um, what I'm doing next, um, so I, I don't have a sand table of my own in the house, but I, you know, I think partly as a result of this work, I partly as a result of the pandemic, um, I've done the thing which I swore I've never would do, um, which was to get into uh, to miniatures, tabletop miniatures, um, as opposed to hex and counter cardboard games. Um, and so I've been doing some painting. Um, I'm particularly in love actually though with the two millimeter scale. Um, if you haven't seen um, the two millimeter scale in um, military miniatures, what you get are um, very sort of abstract pieces that represent formations at a very high level. So it's possible to do something like a major battle at one to one or one to two scale on a tabletop because the, um, you know, the individual pieces that you're working with are, are so very tiny. Um, and I've just, um, you know, I talked a little bit about sort of the optics of big folks looming over small things on tabletops during this talk, um, I think that's actually part of what accounts for my interest in this particular uh, hobby scale. Well, Matt, I appreciate that. I don't see any questions, but I will leave you with one last question is, mm -hmm. um, if you had unlimited time, unlimited money, un you know what I mean? The, you know what I mean? Everything just opened up to you. Right. What is a game that you would want to get designed, either you designing it or having someone else design it for you and why? 
Oh gosh, I would, I think, have to think about that, Sebastian. I guess if I had unlimited time and unlimited money, I'd first have to think about how high a priority game design would be in such a scenario. Um, but um, I, it's 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 a lovely question. I I don't have an answer on the tip of my tongue, unfortunately. Well, I will wait for your answer on Twitter then. All right. So, well, everyone, please thank Matt in the chat for his wonderful presentation. I definitely learned a lot and I hope to have you back here on again, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let me just add to um, if there are folks out there who have other things that you think I should look at. I'm going to go ahead and save a copy of the chat right now. But if there are things that you think I should look at, people I should talk to, archival sources I should look at, um, please don't hesitate to send them my way. Um, let me go ahead and put my email into the chat. I'm easy to find online through my uh, university presence, but you can reach me, mgk at umd.edu. And um, if folks just have a sand table story they want to share, um, I'd love to hear those too. So thanks so much.